One of the people I've enjoyed the most uh, on YouTube is George Gammon. You can find him. It's uh, last name is spelled G-A-M-M-O-N for those people listening by radio. You can find him at Twitter at George Gammon. But I highly recommend the sort of masterclass presentations he puts on on a daily and weekly basis on YouTube. What is really important is he makes things that are otherwise difficult to understand, that are not within the universal uh, language of the ordinary and everyday person, accessible and gives information that in turn is actionable. It's that combination that is a rare skill set in today's economic world, especially if you're watching places like CNBC and other CNN and the rest. So, George, uh, glad to have you on tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, George, I think a lot of people don't fully appreciate for a range of reasons. In part, I think there's a degree of economic illiteracy within the within the country that the media has helped propagate and push to sort of protect the privileged classes and the, and the central banks from meaningful scrutiny. But also, I think there's people who, for their own motivation or incentive, either self-interest, they don't want to see something bad really about to happen, or people who are Trump supporters, for example, who want to believe that this will not actually crash down on his head. Could you explain in sort of a, a summary fashion, before we go into sort of further detail, why the, the probability of just a magical bounce back in the economy is not a likely short-term outcome? Right. I get that a lot on Twitter and social media and in the comments of my YouTube videos. And what I start off with is asking them, OK, if we're going to go back to normal, normal means an economy that can't handle interest rates over 2 percent. Normal means an economy that needs the Fed's balance sheet at 4.5 trillion and growing. So personally, I don't consider that normal and I don't consider it healthy. So my point is, if we go back to something like that, it's going to be very difficult because of the asset bubbles that we've built and the addiction that our entire economy has on artificially low interest rates and money printing. Exactly. I think the analogy or the sort of comparison to drug addiction is a useful one. So it's like people that have reached a certain tolerance level that as their tolerance level gets higher and higher, the, the drug of just sort of pumping cash into the system becomes less and less and less effective. And that we see something like what's happened in Japan. I mean, I think to a lot, like most ordinary Americans still have no idea that Japan experienced a smaller scale version of it and it didn't happen around the globe. So it didn't have the catastrophe, uh, the sort of collapse that could have happened otherwise. Uh, but Japan has basically not recovered for really almost 30 years now. And I think a lot of that context is a lack of understanding of what the Fed really does and is up to. And the like people were distracted by the stimulus bill, but or what was labeled the stimulus bill, if you're going to call it that. While, in fact, a lot more money is being committed to by the Fed in terms of what they're doing and what they are up to. Um, could you explain some of what the debt explosion is and how unusual and unprecedented the degree of debt is across multiple levels within the economic structure today? Oh, geez. Well, before we had the coronavirus pin, and that's not our big problem here. The big problem is the underlying fundamentals of the economy were very, very poor. But as far as debt, we have sovereign debt all time high, corporate debt all time high, consumer debt all time high, state debt all time high. So that goes back to what I was saying earlier on how the economy just cannot handle interest rates above, call it 2%. But I think if you look at Japan, to your to your earlier point, and a lot of people have seen that deflation, the, the two or three decades of just uh, stagnant growth, and they've looked at their balance sheet and say, well, my goodness, they're 220% of GDP, and we printed up $4.5 trillion, let's call it in base money, since 2008. And it didn't create a lot of inflation here. It wasn't hyperinflation like all you Austrian economists were so worried about. But what they're really not understanding is how money is actually created. So you have base money that the Fed controls. And that's when we say they're printing money, quote unquote. They're just creating bank reserves. And then it's up to the primary dealer banks to create a, an additional deposit by buying a financial asset or lending that money into existence using those bank reserves as kind of a, a backup. I won't go deep into the weeds, but that, so what happened is the primary dealers were able to lever up and buy financial assets, which took all the inflation that the Fed created, meaning the expansion of the money supply and drive it into assets like stocks. But this time 
with the federal government now getting in the mix with this two trillion dollar stimulus package, which I think is just the beginning. I think this is the tip of the iceberg. I think they're going to go to a four trillion, six trillion. Who knows where it's going to end? I just I'm calling it now stimulus infinity along with uh, QE infinity. <laughs> uh, but th but my point is it's taking the new money supply that's being created and kind of taking it from the Fed's balance sheet and moving it into the real economy in the form of additional deposits. So why is that a big deal? Because now you have more money in the real economy chasing the goods and services that we all buy on a daily basis. That's whether it's groceries, whether it's car insurance, health insurance, your rent, where the way they did QE in Japan, A, was a lot different. They didn't really get it into the, the, the private sector. And we have, have to remember that the Japanese have almost a 30% savings rate. So they're able to absorb all of those, not treasuries, but all the, the, the Japanese debt with the, the the public themselves, they've got the savings to buy that debt. We as Americans don't have any of the savings. So we rely on foreigners to buy a lot of our debt. So we're much more interest rate sensitive. But my point is that we're a lot different than Japan. And I do think that we're gonna have two or three uh, lost decades like Japan had, but it's not gonna be a deflationary type of stagnation. I think it's gonna be more of an inflationary stagflation, where although nominal GDP growth is actually going up, call it at three or 4%, we have inflation at six, seven or 8%. So when you look at real GDP growth, which is just nominal when you subtract out inflation, we're either flat or we're negative GDP growth. So you've got that in combination with most likely higher unemployment and I see that as a more likely outcome than a Japan type of situation. But on net balance, it's pretty much the same. You have low to no or negative GDP growth. I think one of the fascinating things that you've been getting into is how we may have different dollar markets, if you will. We may have yeah. inflation for CPI, but we may have deflation for house, uh, housing prices. We may have a strong dollar internationally. And even today, there was movement that was taking place that appeared to reflect that kind of parallel trend. Could you give some basic explanation to people of why there are different markets, why they may, may see things happening that don't seem, uh, we're, supposed, we're not supposed to happen together or parallel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They see the dollar going up or down as kind of a binary type thing. Right. So if my groceries are getting more expensive, then, or if we see inflation in the United States, then that means the dollar is quote unquote going down. But uh, it, you've got to look at it as two completely separate markets. So you've got a market for dollars outside of the United States, and you have a market for dollars inside of the United States. And what's the transfer mechanism to get those dollars outside the US? Usually that's through our imports. So we run a trade deficit. So all these countries are nice enough to send us stuff we import the stuff and we export green pieces of paper. Those are dollars. Well, outside the United States, there's a tremendous amount of dollar denominated debt. And I, I won't uh, go into all the reasons why, but uh, it goes back to the dollar being inexpensive 2011, 2012. So they loaded up on this debt, not just countries, but also corporations. So if they have to pay back this debt in dollars that now have appreciated, if they don't have any oil coming into their country for dollar revenue or a lot of tourism or exports, they've got to print their own currency in order to buy those dollars to repay those, those debts. So that means more supply of their currency and less supply of dollars, more demand. That makes the dollar go up on the international FX market. So if you look at the DXY as an example, you can see that going to 100 to 110, but that's really what the dollar is compared to the euro, because that's the most prevalent currency in that basket. Or what's the dollar compared to the yen or the Colombian peso? It doesn't really have a lot to do with the value of the dollar compared to the apples that you buy at the grocery store, right? Because that now is dealing with the amount of dollars that are inside the United States. So if we have this situation where they're doing MMT, as an example, or helicopter money, 
where they start this uh, universal basic income where it's maybe starts off for a month or two, but then it becomes, you know, like every other government program that's temporary, it becomes extremely permanent over time, right? So then you have a, a lot more dollars in the system that are chasing potentially fewer goods and services because now we have all the supply chain disruptions because of what's going on with the coronavirus. And then you have the transfer mechanism for getting those dollars outside of the United States. That's interrupted as well, because remember our imports are reducing. That keeps more dollars within the United States. So then you have that local inflation that you'd see in the CPI, or they'll probably try to, they'll probably try to change the way that the numbers are generated, just like they did in the, the 1990s just like they've recently done. So if you, if you not to go off on a tangent, but if you measured inflation the same way that it, we did in the 1970s, the last 10 years, the inflation rate, the CPI would have been a lot higher. So I, I think they'll most likely do that. But going back to your original point, that's how you could see local inflation in the prices of the goods and services that you buy, while at the same time, you're turning on CNBC and hearing that the dollar is getting a lot stronger. Exactly. And the other thing that was fascinating to me was the con that you could have stagflation, which was supposed to sort of not happen in the first place, but did in the 70s. But that could yeah. be compounded by people's main principal assets also going down in value in the sense that their homes might be going down in value. And for those that have pension funds, uh, that those pension funds could be in serious, serious trouble. And I think most ordinary people, until there was some discussion about it related to the fiscal debate, did not realize the scale or scope to which much of the stock market had been boosted by corporate buybacks, but also yeah. to the degree they didn't realize those corporate buybacks are tied in in part and the corporate debt explosion to making the pension funds look a lot prettier than they are. Could you talk about that? Well, you just hit the nail on the head. I mean, it's, it, there's all these, they're interconnected. It's a daisy chain. And it starts with the pensions having to go further out the risk curve than they normally would because the, the Fed has kept interest rates artificially low. So they have to come up with a 7% return in order to meet their liabilities. So the only way that they can even come close to that with interest rates being at zero for so long is to not only go into the corporate bond market, which is a lot more risk than they typically take, but also to do so with leverage. Most people don't realize that. The, the pension funds just don't go in there. They're levering up to go into the corporate bond market. And then the corporations take those, that money, that inflow of capital, and they just buy their own shares back. And I've seen charts that would suggest since 2010, almost 90% of the uh, value of the stock market or the increase in the stock market has come specifically from corporate buybacks. So that's something that is completely unsustainable. And you get this, uh, I call it a doom vortex, which is just this, this loop that's just, um, it feeds on itself, where if you have stock prices go down, then that makes the corporate balance sheet look a lot worse. And then that downgrades them potentially into, um, into junk debt. And then the pension funds can no longer hold them because they're obligated to just keep investment grade. And then the pension funds have to liquidate. So you've got this type of setup where you could have no buyers in the corporate bond market, while at the same time, you have no buyers in the stock market. They're all going away. And that takes us back to the Fed printing up all this money. And in my opinion, the Fed is going to try to take as much of the private sector balance sheet and move it onto their balance sheet. Because if you've got half the stock market, let's say, or 60% of the bond market on the Fed's balance sheet, if it takes a 50% haircut, the Fed's gonna pay 100 cents on the dollar. So it's, it's in their minds, and I'm saying this is correct, but <laughs> in their yeah. minds, that's a solution for the problem because the economy is built on asset prices or asset bubbles, debt and confidence. If they can keep asset prices high by bringing everything onto their balance sheet, so they're the only seller and they're not gonna sell. That means that the market kind of artificially stays high. I think that's going to be their game plan. But of course, that goes back to what we were saying, where long term, the release valve has to be the U.S. dollar. And what's extraordinary to me about all, a lot of this is, for example, I mean, I, I had heard of MMT, but I thought MMT was sort of a marginal left wing original theory and whatnot. 
I did not realize the degree to which it had become mainstreamed within certain finance sectors and the economic advisor sectors until this happened. Because I started reaching out to friends of mine. Some are venture capitalists, but some are economic advisors with access to the president. And I was like, aren't you worried that you're, you know, we're sort of a, we're removing the fig leaf from all the problems. And once all the people see all those problems, it's going to come cascading down. And he was like, oh, no, no, we have plenty of tools for that. And I was like, well, what do, you, what do you mean you have plenty of tools for that? I, it didn't really work for Zimbabwe or Hungary in 19. 46 or Weimar Germany or a lot of other places or Argentina in the 1990s. I know of no place where this strategy has actually worked to deal with this kind of problem. Can you describe to people who I, I you know, 95% of people I'm sure have never even heard what this MMT is. And aside from all the other alphabet like agencies the Fed has been announcing over the last two weeks, yeah. could you, could yeah. you a lot of them are really predicated on the assumption that MMT can just solve our problems. Could you address what MMT is and what some of the critics say are major deficiencies with it? I'll tell you what I think is a deficiency with it right, right off the bat. I think that we've, as a society, and the politicians and the economists have suffered from recency bias. And that just means that whatever's happened over the last 10 years is just going to continue to happen indefinitely into the future. And that means if we can print up all this money, again, take the Fed's balance sheet going for $4.5 trillion and it doesn't create inflation, then no matter how much money we print on a moving forward basis, it will not create inflation. So the, the problem with that, and I think what your friends were telling you, is that the Fed has a lot of, quote unquote, tools to solve that problem. Well, yeah, their tools are to raise interest rates like Paul Volcker did in uh, the early 1980s. The problem with, our, with that, uh, quote unquote, solution is the debt to GDP in the early 80s was only about 30%. Okay, well, now it's 110 percent and we've got trillion dollar deficits. That's without the stimulus package. So my point is that you've got so much more debt in the system and we've been we've the economy is now addicted to almost zero percent interest rates to take interest rates above on Fed funds. Even two or three percent would completely crush the economy to the extent that if you normalized interest rates and you know going up to five or six percent, that would most likely have the exact same impact of the coronavirus. It would be almost one in the same. So those uh, tools, in fact, Volcker said that himself before he passed away. He was asked if now we could do the same thing he did in the early 1980s. And he said, no way, absolutely no chance. You could not do it. And so that, that's first and foremost. Second, what is MMT? That's really the belief system that the government or the Fed can print as much money as they want and it just really won't matter. And the only thing that we really need to be concerned with is the rate of inflation. And um, I, I think initially you can tell why that's kind of a bad idea because once the infl inflation genie gets out of the bottle, then it's almost impossible to get it back in. And their solution for that, they see the treasury as spending money into existence. And it gets quite esoteric here. So I'll just try to give you the, the, the broad overview. So the treasury spends money into existence and when they tax money, they destroy the, the, the money supply. So when they spend it, it's increasing the money supply. When they tax it, it's destroying the money supply. So according to them, their policy solution for in, uh, uh, inflation that was getting out of hand would be just to increase taxes. Well, the problem with that is that if we go into a stagflationary environment where you've got this negative uh, real GDP growth, the economy is really struggling and you've got high uninflation, the last thing that you want to do is jack taxes up to call it 60 percent. And when I'm talking about increasing taxes, I want to be clear, it's not just increasing taxes on the, the quote unquote rich or the one percent or increasing capital gains tax. It's because that wouldn't pull enough money out of the system. So you would have to increase the taxes on the poor and middle class because they're the majority of the tax base. Particularly because they have to get the money back out of the economy to solve their problem of inflation. And that means they need to get it from the consumers that are otherwise spending it in order to be able to counteract the problem that MMT inherits. And what's fascinating to me is even MMT doesn't say in the case of a supply shock, like we have currently, that somehow you're going to be able to manage this issue. So it's, it's, I've been unsettled by the lack of public discussion and debate 
about what exactly the Fed is up to, what exactly the economic solutions are. And I get that Trump is sort of thinks that mindset over matter and that he can just convince people to have confidence and magically will all back back. And if he manages to pull that circus trick, God bless him, I hope he does it. But realistically, I, I, the, I think he's underestimating the economic pain that is coming down the pipeline, in part because I think he didn't fully get why the stock market was going that way. And then you have things like the Fed, maybe they're going to bail out. They're already sort of bailing out foreign banks in terms of what they're doing over the last several days. Uh, now, you know, Trump may have some sympathy with Deutsche Bank uh, because they were a nice lender to him over the past decade or so. And some other lenders walked away from the risk that was Trump in some context. But you have those issues that are sort of pending. Um, and so it seems like the scope and scale of it, you have a general populace that doesn't really fully get what's really happening, but they're the ones that are going to suffer the consequences of what our public policy decision makers are doing now. Can you describe a little bit about, like, the, the Fed seems to think they can paper over a lot of problems, at least in the near short term. How many, I think, is there now six or seven different uh, uh, little acronym agencies that they've announced over the past uh, 10 days? Yeah. Yeah, if not more, it just it, every single day there's another one. The last one that I know of it was the the FEMA program. You referenced that earlier, where the Fed basically set up a repo market outside of the United States. But if if you think that one through, and I'm not sure if your viewers know how that one works, but basically, there all of these countries, not all of them, but a lot of the countries outside the United States and the corporations have a lot of treasuries on their balance sheet. So we talked about the 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 liability side of their balance sheet earlier, holding dollar denominated debt. But the good thing for them is a lot of them have a lot of dollar denominated assets in the form of these treasuries. Well, the Fed, regardless of what they say, they set up this repo market. So they go to XYZ country and they say, well, first of all, wait a minute. You've got to sell your treasuries right now because you need the liquidity. You need the dollars. But we don't want you to do that because if you sell your treasuries onto the open market, that's going to create more supply. So the interest rates on the treasuries are going to go up. Well, the Fed knows that they can't have interest rates go up on the treasuries because that has a knock on effect in interest rates in the United States. And that crushes the economy. It brings down the house of cards, like we were saying earlier. So the Fed sets up a repo market, which basically says, we'll take your treasuries, we'll put them onto our balance sheet, and then we'll just give you the dollars that you need to go ahead and pay off your debts. Now, of course, the Fed is saying this is temporary, it's only going to be up six months, and these are just uh, short-term loans or however they want to categorize repurchase agreements, because they, they say that they're uh, technically buying them, but that, that gets into some muddy water. But my point is they're giving these um, entities outside the United States dollars at basically 0% interest. The Fed's taking the treasuries. So again, they don't have to be sold into the market and to keep interest rates artificially low. But if you think that one through, they're pegging the yield curve just like they did back in uh, World War II. If they peg the yield curve by printing more money and expanding their balance sheet, that the market sees that is potential future inflation. So no one in their right mind wants to hold a 10-year treasury or a 30-year treasury because you're holding dollars. You don't want to hold on to that for 10 years if you're only getting 2% interest when inflation will most likely be 5% because the Fed's taken their balance sheet to 30 trillion. So you're going to try to sell that. Well, you've got this these cross currents happening at the same time where the Fed is trying to create more demand to soak up those treasuries, but the market is trying to sell those treasuries off because of the inflation expectations, which creates another doom vortex where the Fed, the, the, the more the market tries to sell off the treasuries, the more money the Fed has to print, and it just goes in the circle. Exactly, we'll be right back after the break with George. And I'm here to tell you, I don't need you to thank me and tell me I've done a good job. I've done nothing but my duty. I discovered a bunch of blood Six years, Alex Jones and InfoWars have been sounding the alarm for patriots worldwide, waking people up to the new world order, Bohemian Grove, the American deep state, the rise of communist China, 
the plan for global depopulation and global elite pedophiles who prey off of our young. The enemy has done their best to destroy us, but because of your support, our fight continues. Join us, support the info war, and together we will slay the dragon. Keep fighting, Alex, you're the gladiator. When the globalists and the mainstream media and the big box stores zig, we zag. They've all been raising prices on high quality nutraceuticals and supplements because people are doing their own research and grabbing them off the shelves. Well, guess what? We've cut the prices on our best selling products massively. And despite the fact that our iodine selling out, X2 just did, X3 is going to 60% off. That's right, folks, even though it's about to sell out. Our amazing super blue fluoride free toothpaste with the nano silver, uh, the tea tree oil, and the iodine, it's still 50% off, about to sell out. And then, Real Red Pill, Real Red Pill Plus, the big multivitamin mineral with preglinone and all that zinc, it's 50% off right now at InfoWarsStore.com. And a bunch of other best-selling items are as well. So get your X3 before it sells out, 60% off. Get your Real Red Pill Plus, 50% off. Get Living Defense, 40% off. DNA Force, 50% off at InfoWarsStore.com. Meet the American Empire. You know, it's even in mainline history books at PhD level that the British Empire was declining by the 1920s and they wanted to merge with America. Not the British people, they're great folks, but the elites that had controlled the British people and parlayed it into an empire, the Rothschilds and others. And this map from a few years ago breaks down the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, the Trilateral Commission, and shows all the big corporate, banking, academic, media heads that are members of it, and they all create a consensus at the top, and then they go out and project that into the public and try to bankrupt and shut down anyone that doesn't submit to them. They're anti-God, they're anti-family, they're monopoly men and women. They want absolute total control and they control the big banks and give themselves unlimited fiat resources, but then they hand us the debt. And these individuals absolutely are anti-American and have set China up to dominate the United States into the future. But with President Trump and the populist movement, we've been defeating that. That's why they're so pissed and have used COVID-19, the chi -Com, virus to absolutely terrorize the public and the world into shutting America down the only way they can punish us for not submitting to their tyranny. They want your immune system lowered. They want you sick. They want you paycheck to paycheck. They don't want you to have storable food. They want you surveilled by your cell phones and 5G. They want to run your lives. And right now they're trying to break your will. And if you submit to them and roll over and, and, and show your belly to them, it's only going to encourage them to launch more bioweapons like they've done to drive you into submission in the future. We can defeat this scum. Their power structure was falling. That's why they've had to launch this desperate operation. So when you spread the links at band.video and infowars.com, it's a revolutionary act against these scum. Welcome back to American Countdown. Uh, if you want to call in, uh, we're going to be taking calls in the bottom half of the hour. Uh, you can call in at 877-789-2539. That's 877-789-2539. If you're calling internationally, you uh, put in your area code, your country code, and 1-512-646-1776. That's uh, 1-512-646-1776. 1776. Call in. We'll try to uh, answer your questions the best uh, we can and try to have something uh, distilled within about a minute. Uh, George, a couple of questions, uh, additional questions I had before we let you go. Uh, thanks for sharing your time. And I recommend everybody go to his YouTube page. It is literally a master class. If you want to learn about leverage, if you want to learn about shock, if you want to learn about the Fed, if you want to learn about the housing market, if you want to learn about, he'll have various guests on there. They'll have great ideas. I'll, I'll just throw one little clue out there. You know, oil tankers might be a good idea right now. So there's all yeah. kinds of things that are useful and interesting and insightful on a daily basis. It's a master class in education that is both accessible to people. You don't have to be go 
get an economics degree before you have to listen to George to understand what he's saying. And he gives actionable intel that you can use for your everyday life and your economy. So go to YouTube, George Gammon. That's G-A-M-M-O-N. Follow him on Twitter at at George Gammon. One thing that fascinated me, George, was the speed with which the Fed committed to what you were calling Buzz Lightyear, Infinity and Beyond versions of quantitative easing, where they were basically saying, we'll just buy everything now. We won't even do the fig leaf, but we'll do it. And they're not, they're not taking it as collateral through their primary dealers. None of that anymore. It's just, we'll buy bonds, we'll buy stocks. And ultimately, it was like the Fed could get into a position where they, owe, where they actually own most Americans' mortgages if they want to. Right. They could get yeah. into a position where they own most of America's corporations. And this could happen without a public discussion ever occurring in this country. Could you explain how that could happen? Sure. It goes back to what we were saying on how I think the Fed is going to try to take the private sector balance sheet. And that's what I mean by that. So let me unpack that a little bit so it's easier to understand. So you've got equity and debt in the private sector. That Let's call it equity of the uh, S&P 500, the companies that are there. And then you have their bonds in the bond market. Well, if the Fed buys the majority of the S&P, then they're going to own a big equity stake in a lot of our major, major corporations. Also, if they own the debt, and they also have a, a, a big controlling stake. And then when you combine that with them being able to buy a lot of the mortgages through mortgage-backed securities, they could, I mean, they could have the title to, or the claim uh, to most houses in the United States, most companies, and most of the debt, including the debt of the United States government. Wow. And what do you think could happen in terms of things like people are looking at gold, people are looking at Bitcoin? To what degree? A lot of people that are sort of in this intellectual space have traditionally liked those as a sort of counter against these kind of central bank wayward activities. But there's some doubt as to what's exactly going to happen, at least in the near short term. What's your instinctual take on that? Well, those are two completely separate questions because the asset classes themselves are so different. When I look at my own portfolio or what I suggest for people that watch my YouTube videos is you've got to compartmentalize it. So I like to allocate 10% to insurance. For me, that's just physical gold. Then I also like to allocate 10% to speculation. I define that as just buying something because I think the value is going to go up in the, in the future, hopefully some asymmetry. And Bitcoin would definitely fall into that category. As far as the government, I mean, you've got counterparty risk there in the sense that the government could confiscate your gold. They've done it in the past. And the government could definitely make Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency illegal to use. And I think that one of the main factors or components that's going to come out of this downturn that we're going into or this crisis is the government is not going to let it go to waste. And I think they're going to come up with, well, they've already come up with a digital U.S. currency. That's That seed has been planted. But I think they're most likely going to use this crisis as an opportunity to implement a government-backed digital currency and ban cash. So a lot of people just think, well, it's not a big deal because most of the dollars that I have are, are electronic. They're just in my bank account or on my debit card. But the, what you don't understand is a digital U.S. or government-backed currency would put, call it a serial number, on every single dollar in the system. So they would know where you're spending every single dime, and they could control it. They could control the demand side. And if you wanted to take that money outside of the United States, they could just simply put the kibosh on it very quickly. But even for people inside the United States, let's say you had, a, they, they wanted to promote some sort of business, call it green energy. And I'm not here to debate whether that's good or bad, but they could force you to use half your income on this, this asset class if the government's pushing it. Another thing, if you want to talk about personal liberties and restrictions, let's say you're someone that goes out and you um, are an average person, but you make a mistake and get a DUI. It's your first one. You didn't hurt anybody. You, you go and pay the fines, whatever. Well, the government could come in and say, all right, well, from now on for the next five years, we're not allowing you to buy alcohol. 
And if you think it through, they could control that because every single merchant would have to be set up under the same system. It would have a serial number. So the, the system that the merchant is set up with would be able to monitor that uh, serial number and control what you buy and what you sell. Think that one through. If they wanted to keep um, interest rates low, they could just prevent you from selling your U.S. treasuries. And then that has the same type of effect. I mean, you could go down the rabbit hole for the next four hours on how that's a really, really bad idea if you're someone who values personal liberty. But I think that's most likely coming down the pipeline. And with whatever I'm saying, I, I want to be clear. I just look at things as, as what's the most probable outcome. There are no certainties at all. We could see something where we go to a gold back a, a dollar, we go into a gold standard again, or we go to a dollar, who knows, it could be backed by Bitcoin. Uh, we could use Bitcoin as the, the world reserve currency. From a philosophical standpoint, I would absolutely love that. But I'm just saying that anything is uh, possible. It's just, what are the probabilities? Oh, exactly. I'm a big sports better, and as a lawyer, I like to give people advice. As everything's probabilities. They're not always thrilled with that. They would love the certain outcome, but that things are just weighing probabilities. Great sports gamblers, it's the same thing. You're just trying to beat the, you know, beat the edge by a little bit, be 56% right rather than 52% right, and that's what makes a great gambler in the modern world. I think another thing about, I mean, I think especially when you combine politics and economics, something like a digital currency fits within what the state would want because it empowers them to an extraordinary degree and they could have every justification for it. And in fact, our current currency problems that are about to be accelerated over the next year or two would particularly uh, be the pretext for, hey, here's our solution. This can help solve it. I've even heard discussion that maybe there would be a global digital currency controlled by states in different ways. What do you think about that idea? Is there a, a possibility of that occurring and how much of that is a risk versus say uh, a national digital currency? I definitely think it's a possibility because to your point, it gives governments so much control. And not only from a taxation standpoint, but it also gives them control over interest rates or the, the central bank, let's call it. Right now, it would be very difficult for the Fed to take interest rates to like a negative five because people just withdraw their cash. You might be able to go down 50 basis points like they have in some places in Europe, but at, at a certain point, the general public draws the line and they take their money elsewhere. But with a digital currency, you're, you could not take your purchasing power out of the banking system. Right. And there, so that would not be a constraint. That's another reason why I think you'll most likely see this at some point in time, because the central banks are full of Keynesians. And um, the, 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 in, the, in their mind, the way their models work is the way you solve uh, the problem of the business cycle is just by lowering interest rates. That's how you smooth out a recession, is you gotta create more demand. Well, the way their models work, and I, I've never seen them, but I would assume based on their actions, that if you have interest rates at zero, well, if the solution for a recession is to take interest rates from 4%, let's say down to zero, well, then the solution, if you're already at zero, has gotta be to take them to negative four, problem solved. Yeah, right. they, they don't think they, it's just like a, a, a calculator or a board game to them. They don't realize that human beings, it, it might not work in practice. So since you've got a, um, a global consensus on how to handle a recession or a depression, I think that's going to really drive them to incorporate that even faster. And I think what's it's always for your security. That's how they always sell it to the general public. So whether they're going to say, you've got to give us all your cash and we've got to ban it because the coronavirus is spreading so fast and you don't want to touch that dirty cash, or they're going to say, we need to do MMT. And in order to get you your MMT payments or your universal basic income, it's very cumbersome to send it in the mail. So why don't you just go ahead and download the United States government app, and then we can just electronically wire the money to you every single month, just instantly. And of course, most people are going to go right along with that. They're going to think that's the best thing since sliced bread. But of course, now they're tracking you. Now they're, they're, now they're um, not only controlling, but monitoring 
what you're spending money on and then what you're not spending money on. So to take that to the next level where you're talking about a global digital currency, I think that you could have something like the SDR, which Jim Rickards has talked about quite a bit, and you could have local currencies, but they're all transferable into that global digital currency. And that just takes it to a whole new level of Big Brother. Oh, exactly. I mean, what's extraordinary is to your point, just today they were saying that it's going to take so long to send those checks out that anybody that doesn't have a bank account they can transfer. It may, it may not even be until September that you get it. You have people like Congresswoman Tlaib saying, you know, it'd be great if we had some sort of direct credit system instead. And the uh, so the initial one was talking about a, a credit card or debit card of some sort. But you're right, what would make much more sense is just to add an app to your smartphone that's already tracking you to make sure you're not sharing the virus or violating social distancing rules as is currently being applied. So it's a natural extension to that. Uh, what would you say to people in terms of how they should prepare for what's coming? And what are some of the steps they can take aside from self-education uh, to prepare for what's coming very soon and what's coming over time? I think the easiest thing the average Joe can do is just make sure that if they do have a mortgage, it's a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. If we do see inflation, uh, stagflation, then you're going to be very, you're going to be much better off if you've got a fixed rate uh, mortgage. So why is that? Because let's say you can fix a rate right now at four percent, but inflation goes up to six or seven percent. Well, the delta between your interest rate and the rate of inflation is a transfer of wealth from the lender to the borrower, which would be you because you're paying back that mortgage in cheaper dollars, devalued dollars. So that's, I think, the easiest thing people can do. The next thing would be to make sure that you've got some physical precious metals, and I'm not saying. 100% of your portfolio, nothing like that. Uh, for me personally, I like to have 10%, and that's just a hedge against what's going on. It, maybe for you, it's Bitcoin, uh, something that, that's fixed. It, it's in limited quantity. Uh, I think real assets, hard assets, are going to be the only place to hide in the in the future. And also, my the way I'm thinking through my personal investment strategy is to focus on the basics. I think we've gone so long with having all, the, uh, all these companies that don't make money, that just continually lose billions and billions of dollars. I think of an Uber that everyone loves Uber, but the fact of the matter is the only way they can provide that service is if they just literally just burn, incinerate money. I, I remember a quarter last year where they literally lost $4.5 billion in one quarter. Well, that really couldn't exist unless there was all this super cheap money. So my point is what I'm focusing on is food, shelter, and energy. That's really the, the three things. Because I think if you just take it right back to basics, that regardless of how bad this recession is, or if we go into a depression, uh, I think people are gonna be less extravagant. And as long as you're in those type of hard assets, you might not make money, but I think you'll lose a lot less than if you had your money in like uh, shares of, of Tesla <laughs> or something <laughs> like that. Right, exactly. Oh, well, thanks a lot, George. Thanks for joining us. Everybody can go and follow him on YouTube, see his videos. He has tons of videos up. It's a great way to get self-educated quickly. You can go follow him on Twitter, at George Gammon. Thanks a lot for being with us, George, and appreciate this, especially on short notice. Thank you for having me. Absolutely.